Frank's Red Hot is the perfect blend of flavor and heat. So you can use an entire bottle to make recipes like buffalo chicken dip or buffalo nachos. Or even things that don't start with buffalo. Frank's Red Hot. I put that shit on everything. Are you ready, Craig? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Uh, welcome, everyone, to episode seven of Podcast Versus Everyone. Uh, last week, I forgot to introduce ourselves. Uh, so I, I'm Craig Powers of FoodCenter.com and Twitter.com. And and uh, with me, as always, is Jeff Nusser, not Jeff Nusser. Um, That's right. How are you doing today, Jeff? I'm awesome, man. It's Wednesday. Uh, I only have two more days of work. The snow's not here, so I mean we're. I think we're doing pretty good. Excellent. Yeah. So um, as always, we'll kick this thing off by talking a little bit about beer. Um, so Jeff, uh, what what have you been drinking this week? So last weekend, I uh, I made a, a quick pit stop by Pint Defiance uh, out in Tacoma. I know you are familiar with Pint Defiance, but our listeners might not be. So it's just it's a beer store. Uh, out in Tacoma, out by uh, Tacoma Community College, if you're familiar with the area at all. Technically for us. There we go. So, uh, so anyway, I stopped by there because um, it's it's the you know what, the place that I typically go around my house um, yeah. doesn't usually have a very large assortment of single cans, and they sort of frown on that. So, um, but since I you know like to try a lot of different things pint defiance is great because they'll let you take singles of anything yeah. um so one of the things i grabbed was uh ruben's brews bits and bobs and which is the 2018 version they they um, rotate the hops each year um and make make an ipa and so this is this is the first um i think this is the first review of a beer on this podcast where the beer is just kind of eh like it's just okay yeah. Um, it, it, it kind of, unfortunately, like I really liked the one last year. So of course that, like I said, they change up the hops every year, really liked the one last year. This one tasted much more just sort of like a run in the mill IPA. So, um, on the Gardner Minshew scale, you know, sometimes even Gardner Minshew throws one at somebody's feet and, and that's kind of what this one is. Yeah. Um, so interesting note about Pine Defiance, uh, it's, uh, original owner, longtime owner, Barry, who's very famous in the Seattle Tacoma, you know, well known in the Seattle Tacoma, you know, sound beer and a super nice guy. And yeah, very nice guy. Um, it, um, actually, just sold it, and so he's now entering uh, semi-retirement, as he told me. Um, and so, uh, congrats to him. Um, yeah. Uh, he he sounded confident about the people that bought it. I we should all be semi-retired. That would be great. Yeah, that would be good. He's not that old too. He's like early fifties, so yeah, good for him. Yeah, um, so uh, you know, I know I contributed uh, quite a hell of a lot to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> I find this is a great bar. Uh, great yeah, store as well. It's a store and a bar. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd go. I, I definitely would go there more, but they don't allow uh, kids, so I can't take B in there. Yeah, uh, that makes it harder. But yeah, definitely a great source of beer for me. Uh, a great money pit for me as well. Um, yeah, so uh, this week um, I'm rolling rolling hard. Uh, I got a, um, a a barley wine, a bourbon barrel aged barley wine. Um, it's from Smog City, uh, which is a brewery out of Torrance, California, which is in the Los Angeles area. Um, and it is called Bourbon Barrel Aged O-E. O-E stands for Old English, which is <laughs> their English-style barley wine. Uh, so, um, so, All right. yeah, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a hefty beer. Um, I haven't eaten much today. It's 13.1%. I'm drinking a 500-milliliter bottle, which, if you don't know the conversion, that is 16.9 ounces of 13% beer. Um, I am, uh, counting calories. Uh, so I, I did, uh, there's like, a, you know, online, you can go online, put an ABV of something, they'll give you a rough estimate of the calories. This is definitely pushing north of 500 calories for this bottle. 
um, which is larger than both my lunch and dinner, or well, not combined, but each my lunch and dinner uh, had uh, less than 500 calories. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, that is how you spend those calories wisely, my friend. Absolutely. You know, hey, this is, you know, grain, a lot, a lot and a lot of grain in this. So it's uh, you get whatever the hell you get from that. So it's um, actually yeah. kind of healthy is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I'm actually drinking this beer out of a glass, a, a very special glass. So um, in I think the first podcast of our podcast versus everyone, uh, we did some uh, podcast recommendations, and one of mine was uh, this Malt Couture. It's a it's a beer comedy podcast, uh, which was started by uh, kind of one of the uh, most well known kind of beer bloggers in in the in the craft beer space. Um, he he goes by Don't Drink Beer. Um, uh, he says drinking beer so you don't have to, but he's a huge barley wine proponent so and he's also he, uh, uh, kind of he makes fun of the industry quite a bit and one of the um kind of one of the uh, uh emerging trends have been kind of uh breweries making especially uh virginia breweries i'm not sure why uh making glassware and and even some beers that just straight up rip off like 80s and 90s nostalgia like it'll be like in a, typically like video games like 8-bit and 16-bit video games they'll have like you know, uh, Metroid or, or Ninja Turtles or Mario, like, and not even hiding it, they straight up just look like that, and they'll put that on a glass, and then, like, beer nerds who are roughly my age will freak out, because most of them are roughly my age, because uh, that's when the point you, you have the beer, the money to spend on it, and, and you need something to obsess over, but, uh, uh, so they buy, they freak out about these, um, but it's just straight up some intellectual property that's ripped off, and I think... <laughs> I think the number, the quantity of glasses and the, and the, like, I don't think it's probably just not really worth it. I know that some companies have gotten, you know, cease and desist letters. So um, this uh, glass, and you can go on my Twitter uh, at the Craig Powers to see the glass. Um, it, oh, on the back, it says barley wine is life and, and don't drink beer. And then permanent hangover is the company that sold it. Um, this glass in particular was made. Um, they sold it um, at a festival in Florida, um, at Jay Wakefield. Uh, it's a famous brewery and, and um, sold at their festival. And then they sold the rest to um, their Patreon subscribers. I'm, I'm a Patreon subscriber to their podcast. So he he does this thing. So there's a, I'll, I'll get to somewhere eventually. Um, he, the, uh, he <laughs> Don't uses, worry, we, we have all night, man. In, in a lot of his memes, he uses um, otters uh, because... Uh, one of the the primary um, uh, grains used in uh, malted grains used in uh, uh, barley wine is called Maris Otter, um, and so uh, he so he's basically got this. It sort of looks like a Mega Man little like uh, he's got like a Mega Man gun on his arm and he's shooting out these cease and desist letters, um, and it's, it's two little otters. They're pretty cute, but uh, yeah. So um, I was pretty excited to pick this up. Because, uh, you know, Jeff, I don't have enough uh, beer glassware. No, no, you definitely need more. <laughs> definitely yeah. need more. You need one for every kind of variation of a kind of beer. I almost do. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember once uh, I, I posted a beer uh, somewhere on Twitter, something in, in, our, in our Slack. Uh, Sherwood goes like, do you have a beer, a different glass for every single beer you drink? And I'm like... Not quite, you know, like, Almost. but this, this is my first one. This will definitely be my barley wine glass. Um, obviously, it says barley wine is life. That's like his big motto. I lean more towards Lambic is life, but I do love barley wine. Um, and so uh, this is my first uh, barley wine out of this glass. I was saving it. And this is actually a, a highly recommended beer from him. And um, so I uh, I bought quite a bit of it when I had the opportunity. Um, but yeah, it's... um. It's excellent. Uh, just a very well done barley wine. Um, you got some caramel notes, some raisin notes. Um, definitely very uh, influenced by the cask, uh, the, the the barrel. Um, you, you get some burn from the alcohol. Uh, just a, it's just a very well done barley wine, and it's not super hard to acquire down there. Uh, they ship it out to. Uh, you know your total wines and things like that, so it's it's not a super rare one, but it, and I actually got it off a 
a beer buying service that's based out of Seattle. I'm not going to say their name because I don't want to give them free advertising. Because if I'm going to keep mentioning beers that I buy from them, maybe maybe they should uh, send send some. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So if you're listening, unnamed beer distributor, beer seller. Based in Seattle. Based with, in Seattle, where you pick up beer after you buy it. Yeah. Online. Online. <laughs> yeah. Feel free to sponsor me, and I'll, then I'll say your name. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you're listening. <laughs> um, but yeah. So on the Gardner Mitchell scale, uh, uh, man, I you know what? I didn't even think about this. <laughs> you should have uh, thought about it. I know I should have, right? And you've already done yours, so I can't pass like you did. I know. Um, so yeah, uh, on the Gardner Minshew scale, um, I'm gonna go with. I don't think I've used the 89-yard touch, winning touchdown against Utah yet. Um, but that was a pretty. This is a heavy beer. That was a pretty heavy play. Uh, the the the. Uh, uh, um, yeah, just the. Uh, it being in Martin Stadium in that moment, it, I think it was a really early homecoming, which I think kind of kept some of the crowds away. I think people would typically expect homecoming to be the middle of October, and that was, uh, but of course, we don't play games in October anymore. Um, yeah, so, no, apparently not. There's a force uh, field around Martin Stadium in October. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it wasn't the biggest crowd, but, man, like, when that moment happened, the, that place erupted. Like, I've never seen. And that just felt – it felt like a huge moment at the time. It felt like something big. Um, like, it felt really important. I think a lot of us were thinking, great, we have our fourth win. We're headed to a bowl – you know, we're you know we're that much closer to a bowl game. Right. Obviously, there was much, <laughs> there was much more going on because we – then we that was the start of a winning streak that didn't end until the Apple Cup, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, then so yeah uh, uh, yeah that's it's it's this is a great beer that was a great play um, I'm I felt delirious um, after that moment and by the time I finish this during this podcast given how much I've eaten today I'll probably feel pretty delirious at that time and what I think I I actually hear you saying is it's a good idea to stick around until the end of the podcast today, just to see what will come out of Craig's mouth after drinking this entire 13% beer. Yep. Um, I would, I, I would recommend it. I'm already, <laughs> my, my cheeks are already feeling hot and I'm ready. Yeah. To... Should we talk about some spring football? Yeah. So um, what we're going to do um, for our loyal listeners uh, each week leading into spring football, we're going to, preview a different position uh we set out about four um because we got four weeks until uh spring football starts and then we can actually start talking about you know those really important and really insightful practice reports that just mean everything where you where you learn guys like andre Lintz or uh, the next <laughs> big thing um, uh, yeah every but, year we, we can wait until those practice reports start coming so before we can start making fun of that um yeah. I think that would make an awesome segment, by the way. Like yeah. just, you know, random practice report dude who will probably not do anything in September. Oh, yeah. And we'll, we'll be here for you be between the Coog fan and Theo practice reports. Um, That's I'm right. Sure we'll, we'll, we'll find – we'll pick out some gems or just from the Mike Leach quotes and everything. So uh, yeah. that they are able to watch, of course. Um but yeah, uh, so Jeff, uh, I wanted to kick it off uh, with definitely a, a position where we probably, like WC probably has one of its best players, but also one of its thinnest positions, and that's running back. Um, if you look at the roster, there is two walk-ons, a fullback, and a guy that's the size of a fullback, and then there's Matt. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. And then we have there is one running back um, with a great name coming in uh, the fall. Not not yet registered. Not a uh, not yet enrolled. So um, we'll have uh, WC will have two scholarship running backs. Um, what is it? Joven Jovenzel Brazil. I, I believe it's pronounced Jovensley Brazil. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, just a great name. Um, two great name running backs, but and he will he will al almost certainly see playing time this year. Uh, just 
out of sheer need. But Jeff, so what, what's your feeling on running back? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, life after booby, right? Where it's like, okay, so, you know, what do we do now? And, um, you know, they're, they're really sort of feeling the effects of, of kind of having two, you know, kind of nothing running back classes. And um, it, it's kind of the downside of having, uh, you know, having a couple guys really step in early, you know, young and be very, very good for the program, but not so, not so good that they're leaving early for the NFL. Now I know James Williams is leaving early for the NFL, but I'm mostly talking about Jamal Morrow and Gerard Wicks. And, you know, those were guys who, who, you know, basically were four year running backs. Right. Um, and so there were these guys who came in and then just kind of looked around and went, you know, I'm stuck behind a guy, two guys who are going to be carrying the ball for, you know, three more years. So you got a guy like, um, you know, Squally Canada who goes to BYU with the best name ever and, you know, has, you know, he was fine at BYU. And I mean, that's, that's a guy that, you know, you'd probably like to still have around. I I think he might've been a senior this year if he hadn't transferred, but, but anyway, I'm just kind of talking, you know, those guys, then they kind of whiffed, um, you know, Romello Harris ends up transferring, um, and then Caleb Perry, who was, you know, the guy who they had recruited um, a couple of years ago, um, he ends up transferring too. So you, you, you've got this, you know, giant gap between, you know, James Williams and the next guy, which was Max Borgie. And then, you know, Williams leaves early. So you're, you, now you've got this, you've basically got one guy and, they, and they've recruited running backs kind of like they recruit quarterbacks, right? Where you're really just taking one guy, maybe two in each class. And, uh, you know, that, that can be great, but you know, that can also be, um, sort of challenging. And, um, that, that's kind of where they're at right now is, you know, so you've got Max Borgie. I mean, I'm looking at the spring roster right now and there's, it's only labeled as running backs, Max Borgie and Dominic Tomanico, yep. red shirt, freshman, five, nine, 243 pound walk on running back. So, yeah, the the freshmen are going to play right away. I really would have loved it if one of them had been at least one of them had been able to come in and and enroll early. But I, I got to think that they're unless they really really love the two guys that are coming in. Um, I got to think that they're out there somewhere, um, you know, trying to add a guy, whether it's whether it's a JUCO guy or whether it's um, you know whether it's uh, you know a grad transfer or something. But but I got to think that they're trying to trying to add. Um, one more guy to that stable. Or, hey, you know, maybe Gage Gabrud uh, is just going to convert to a <laughs> running back. You know, he's he's about the right size for it, 6205, right? He's run the we ball know, a bit. You know he can run. Yeah, you know, who cares if he has history of injury problems? It's fine. Mm, you know. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's going to be uh, a very interesting – it's actually not going to be an interesting position to watch in the spring at all. No, it's not. That's what's going to be crazy is, like, Borgie's going to get, like – like, what's what's going to be interesting about it is how do they do this so that Borgie's not the guy touching the ball on every rep for three weeks? Right, because you don't even have, like – you don't even have bodies to throw in there. Like, you you have a – you have, to, a, a, like I said – a uh, a walk-on fullback from Olympia, and then a walk-on enormous dude from <laughs> Hawaii. <laughs> from Hawaii. Yeah. Same high school as Jason Gesser. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, like, do you, I mean, looking ahead to next year, I mean, do you feel, you know, do you feel comfortable with the idea of maybe having more of a workhorse than, than, than we've had in the last, you know, four years or so? Uh, no, um, not, not super comfortable. Uh, Max is very, very good. Uh, but can he catch a hundred passes and rush the ball 250 times or 200 times? I, I don't know. Like he probably can. Like, I don't, I think he has the body for it. Yeah, I think he does. He, he, and, and he runs, you know, he he uh, he, he avoids like he 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 doesn't like even though he he's very good at breaking tackles, he doesn't seek out contact so much. Like he he he's very good at like just with these subtle moves making guys miss. And um, yeah, so I 
I, uh, yeah, it's definitely um, Booby leaving kind of uh, left a huge hole, obviously, because he, he had quite a few more touches than Borgie did last year, except especially early in the year. And so it, it'll be interesting because, you know, Max is just a sophomore still, but I, I you know, it, it'll be kind of fun per, actually to watch him. Leach did have, I think, one 1,000 yard rusher in uh at texas tech and i think all right he, keep talking i'm gonna fact check this yeah i think he had one 1000 yard rusher at texas tech um and uh it, honestly that's what what wc will probably need out of max borgie this year it, um you'll probably see his yards per carry dip and, and whatever but um it, unless one of these the, a new guy coming in is you know lights on fire like borgie did last year um, which they could very well do. Um, Borgie's going to, uh, you know, get, you know, if he gets 200 carries, he has a very good shot at 1,000 yards. So, uh, and then you add another few hundred, you know, four or 500 yards of, of catching the ball, 600, 700 even sometimes. I mean, he could be in line for a huge season. We could even finally, we could see a running back, you know, get and look at all conference honors even, because um, I think he's that good. Uh, obviously, that's not a, a huge stretch, but yeah, it'll be interesting to watch in the fall. Um, it's kind of it's kind of funny that I, we brought it up as our first spring ball um, spring ball topic because it's yeah the, I, yeah the, like you said the most interesting thing will be uh, who's getting those carries in practice. Just are, are they going to line do they own Travell Harris up at running back just to take a carry <laughs> a rep here and there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there was there were zero one thousand yard rushers at Tech. Oh. Shannon Woods came very close. He got nine hundred and twenty six yards in two thousand six. Uh-huh. So yeah. congratulations, Shannon Woods. He had lots of guys who went over a thousand scrimmage yards, oh, okay. um, including Shannon Woods, who had damn near fifteen hundred scrimmage yards, uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, Borgie could. I mean, he's gonna. You know, you figure he's going to get, you know, two thirds of the carries. So, you know, it's at least two thirds of the carries, maybe even something like closer to 70 percent or 75 percent. So, you know, it's entirely possible if he if he runs really well um, that that he could do that. He, you know, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. That's a lot of that's a lot of work to, to put on to put on a guy um, in this offense because you're, you're just asking him to do a lot of. A lot of different things, you know, he's always running Block. instead of sticking. Or, yeah. You know, you're pass protecting, you're blocking, you're, um, you know, you're always running a pattern if you're not carrying the ball, you know, which is a little different than what, um, you know, maybe some other running backs do. So, but I think he's, you know, I think he's up for it. He seems like a guy who likes a challenge. I mean, he came to Wazoo after all. Yeah. And I, you know, and uh, it's interesting. I, I think these guys have the, these these kind of really talented running backs have this mentality because I saw an interview with uh, with Booby and uh, um, with some website about you know his draft prospects and he he kind of mentioned how he's he was never a feature back in, in college and you know he's he's looking forward to like showing his ability um, in that regard. So um, he definitely had that mindset of a feature back but he's um even with the you know i even with the pass catches and and the uh, added in he's no i don't know running back gets as many touches as like you know a penn state running back or something like that you know right so, so i i think that's probably what he's considering to be a feature back i always cons- i considered him to be our feature back last year of course but um uh but yeah but so i i think max probably has that mentality he's probably looking forward uh, to uh, putting up numbers, so uh, that'll be interesting to watch in the fall, and, uh, and and like you said, interesting to see who the heck is practicing here in the in the spring. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, so we we just talked about football there, so that we could uh, gather in those readers. Um, but uh, <laughs> now we got to talk about basketball, which um, well. You know, th- there have been worse weekends, obviously. They, yeah, I mean, they, they won, won a- another game. Um, so this is, you know, they, uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, and and the third straight week where we can talk about 
competitive or winning basketball. So, uh, yeah. as opposed to just massive blowouts. So yeah, it's interesting. Look at the contrast between the two games, Jeff. Um, uh, WSU shot really well from three in both. Um, uh, and then they, uh, but I think obviously the big difference in the two was, uh, how well the opposing team performed on offense. Yeah, so one of the things that I, I kind of wanted us to talk about this week was this this concept of the three point lottery, which uh, you and I you know talk about a lot together, um, and I think you know I refer to sometimes on the site, uh, but don't always I think explain it. I'm not sure people totally understand it. So um, you know, and it, it obviously is sort of lighthearted. Um, in nature, but it, the idea is this, that, um, so Ken Pomeroy, a guy that we refer to a lot, uh, Ken Um, Ken Pomeroy did a thing, I mean, gosh, I don't know, it had to be five or six years ago now, but, um, he kind of looked at, he kind of did an analysis of three point shooting and, um, you know, I'll spare you the, the complicated math, which I only sort of mostly understand. And, uh, you know, just kind of tell you that, that what he found was that, um, teams don't have a ton of control over the percentage that their opponents shoot from three. And, and the basic concept is just that, you know, there, there's a threshold of openness that's required generally for a team to shoot a three pointer. So in other words, you know, I mean, and again, if you just visualize half court basketball, right? Like, you know, a guy catches the ball on the three point line, he doesn't shoot it every time he's thinking, okay, you know, basically what kind of a shooter am I? And am I open? And if I'm not open, then I'm, I'm looking for a better shot, right? I'm either, you know, reversing the ball or I'm going to, you know, throw it down to the post or something, try and reset or cut off of that or whatever. Right. So, um, so the idea is that, you know, if a team is actually a really good guarding team on the three point line on the perimeter, your a team is actually going to have their opponents are actually going to have fewer just three point attempts overall, the ratio of three point attempts to field goal attempts. Um, because, you know, if a team, if your opponents are shooting lots of threes, then, you know, that means that, you know, theoretically they, they, those shots are more open. Um, now some of that is just teams want to shoot. I mean, and we saw that against Utah. So I'm sure we'll come back to that. You know, Utah just wanted to shoot threes and it's hard to stop if a team wants to shoot threes. And of course we watch Washington state. And so we know that really well too, right? If a team wants to shoot, they're going to shoot. But in general, um, the one thing you can generally control on defense is how many three point attempts the opponent takes, because once they take a three point attempt, then it's like, it's kind of out of your hands. And, um, teams can either get hot or get cold from three. And we, and we saw a great example of this last weekend with, um, with Colorado and Utah where, you know, Colorado being a bad three point shooting team, uh, shot lots of threes against Washington state's defense, which tends to induce lots of threes and they missed lots of them. And then you saw Utah who is a really, really good three point shooting team who shoots more three pointers than anybody else in the conference, um, have an unusually hot, you know, uh, game against the Cougars and that really provided the difference. So um, when we say the three point lottery, it's kind of what we're talking about. Like if you're going to let your opponent shoot a lot of threes, then, you know, I mean, you, you don't know really what's going to happen. Maybe they miss a bunch and your defense looks really good. Um, or maybe they make a bunch and, and you kind of get smoked. So, um, you know, WSU is, is at this point sort of famous for playing the three point lottery, both with their defense and with their offense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was, that was never on better display than last weekend. Yeah, and I think that's a nice segue into this weekend, uh, where WSU on Thursday or today, if you probably or whenever you're listening to this podcast, WSU's playing Stanford, who is who allows less three point attempts per field goal attempt than any team in the nation. They are they just 27 percent of their the field goal attempts that their defense allows are uh are three pointers which is uh 11 less than the national average which is 38 percent so uh stanford doesn't typically allow a lot of threes now interesting enough in wsc's first game against stanford they got off plenty of threes uh they were over 40 40 45 percent ish in the range of their field goal attempts which is right along there they were in their normal range and they shot them pretty well hitting 38 percent so um, it was interesting to see that, um, like you said, if a team wants to shoot threes, they're going to shoot threes. Now, usually um, against a defense that doesn't want to allow threes, that's to to that team's detriment if they're hoisting, um, which is, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're closing out really well, teams will be more hesitant. That's 
what you see with like the pack defense and, and things like that, where they you know, the guy thinks he's open, but the closeout's so good that they have a second thought about hoisting. But um, yeah, it was interesting that uh, once I you know I was kind of analyzing this game with and just looking at that, I'm like, oh yeah, that that's a talking point. And then you look at what WSU did um, in the loss in Pullman. Like it, it doesn't really matter. Like if like if if, if they want to shoot them, they're they're gonna shoot them. Yeah, they were buoyed a little bit by Ahmed Ali hitting four out of five. Yeah, uh, Ellaby and Franks combined for three of fourteen. So I think maybe there was. I mean, I won't call it fool's gold because you know Ahmed Ali's. You know, he's a competent three point shooter. So it's not like that was you know Jeff Pollard going out there and hitting four out of five or something. But um, I think that does speak a little bit to maybe what what's where Stanford's emphasis was maybe on trying to keep, uh, you know, Ellaby and Franks from going off. And, you know, one of the things that Stanford features, and and this has been sort of one of my complaints with Ernie, is that, um, you know, defensively, so Stanford doesn't start anybody under 6'3". Their point guard's 6'3", and they go 6'3", 6'5", 6'9", 6'9", 7 foot. You know, and then their backups are 6'5", 6'6", <laughs> and 6'9". And it's just like, okay, so they, they just bring waves of height at you. Um, and that's, that's the main thing that does make perimeter shooting generally more difficult. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see if, if they, you know, if the Cougars do again, you know, on the road this time, um, you know, really just fire away from deep and, you know, honestly, the, the Cougars biggest problem, you know, isn't three point shooting, you know, they, they shoot a bunch and, right. and it generally works out pretty well. The, the issue is the two point shooting and that's where they really struggled against Stanford last time. I think they shot 41 or 42% yeah. on their twos. Um, you know, and I think largely because of that height, you know, WSU is small overall. Um, Robert Franks, I know he's listed at six, nine and people keep saying he's six, nine. He's not six, nine. He's like six, seven. Um, you know, it's really our tallest guy. We, we start a six, nine center in Pollard, but you know, he's, you know, very limited athletically. Um, his backup is six, seven. Um, you know, so it, it's, you know, once this, this team really has a hard time once it gets, long and athletic. yeah, they, they get yeah, long and athletic. <laughs> they're longer and athletic on the perimeter when he starts the right guys. But in, in terms of the interior, they're not. And, and they really struggle when they get in the trees, but, you know, get with a guy like uh, Josh Sharma, you know, a seven footer who he doesn't block a ton of shots, but um, he blocks enough, you know, to affect you. And, and so that's really where I'll be watching is um, not so much the threes. I mean, like, you know, like we both said, they're going to shoot their threes, but um, I, I'm very curious to see if they can, you know, get to the rim a little bit. Um, if they can, uh, you know, maybe be a little more effective at finishing or, or maybe even at least drawing fouls, um, you know, Stanford's a team that will foul you a bit. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, yeah. that, that's the part that's going to be interesting to me. Well, you, you're talking about playing the right guys the, for the size. Um, Deontay Daniels actually started and played, uh, massive amounts of minutes this past weekend after, um in the previous three games not doing that um so i'm kind of like do you think there was an injury there that wasn't discussed or 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 did ernie just kind of revert back to old strategy yeah i mean i think it had to do with pollard i think you know pollard being out because he was out for the utah game got banged in the head against colorado um, was out with concussion-like symptoms, which is, is sort of hilarious because he came back into the game against Colorado after, <laughs> after it happened, um, right? <laughs> so, um, so I think you know, and I and I don't necessarily disagree with Ernie on this. So, I mean, you've still got to play a certain number of guys off your bench. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't just roll with Isaiah Wade for 40 minutes, right? So, yeah, I mean, I guess you could, but that that seems like that would be a bad. Well, you probably can't because Isaiah Wade would probably commit you know, 18 fouls if you tried to play him for 40 minutes. Like they'd be, like, I'm sorry. He's has six or five fouls. He has to go sit down. Like, no, we only have one center. Um, mustache on. Yeah. You know? And so they, you know, they even tried to play Ernie tried to play Devonte Cooper for a few minutes and that was a train wreck. And so it's just like, you know, he really didn't have a lot of options. So I think, you know, he decided, all right, well, let's, you know, when I've got to bring weight off the floor, um, let's go small, you know, let's, let's play, uh, you know, let's play Franks at the five, you know, let's kind of go about it that way yeah. um, and, and play more Daniels. So, you know, which, I, you know, I can't really disagree with that. Devonte Cooper is I'm sure a very nice young man who is a very bad basketball player. Um, and so, you know, probably a better idea to just, you know, 
go small and take your chances. And, but, you know, you saw what, what happens, which is, you know, you, when you're playing Vionte Daniels and Ahmed Ali and you've got, you know, five eleven and six, one out there on the perimeter, um, you know, you're, you're, that's, that's a lot less likely to dissuade other teams from shooting threes than right. you know, what Stanford rolls out there on the perimeter. And and Daniels was largely in a like a non factor on offense. Like he really didn't even take many shots. Uh, and so it's you know as is his general MO. His gen- but you know, even even for him, you know, it was a, a low usage and you know, it's tough when you when you got a guy who you know, I, Daniels on ball defender is yeah, I, he's not that bad, but he's limited by his size. And 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 like you said, you know, a, a closeout from a six-two guy versus a closeout from a six-six guy makes a world of difference in in getting a clean look at a three. Right, and, and maybe even the guy passes it up. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. It's that's that's what we that's what doesn't show up in the box score is you know maybe that guy passes up that shot because here comes a tall guy running at him and just decides okay well now I'm going to reverse it and you know again that doesn't show up in the box score. Yep. Um. So Cal. They're a goddamn mess. Uh, yeah. Uh, still, still, WSU is, you know, WSU has a clear talent advantage, I think, but it, but it's just, and they just raked them over the coals last time. But, but I, you know, it's on the road, and it, it, it's no guarantee. And uh, Ken Palm has a little more than a toss up, uh, and it, he has it as a close game. Um, do you, Jeff, do you think this is going to be a close game against Cal? Probably. I mean, I you know, Cal is terrible, but it's still on the road, and they're not that much worse than us, even though we kind of maybe want to think they are. Um, you know, I mean, it's a team that, you, you know, you just look at their margins lately. They've been generally bad, but they can still, you know, jump up and play with somebody. Um, you know, they only lost to Arizona State by 10, um, lost to UCLA in overtime, lost to Oregon state by eight. Um, and that was on the road. So, I mean that, you know, they're, they're clearly, you know, still fighting, you know, they're still trying, um, even if they're a total mess. So, um, you know, I think there's, and, and you can, you really can't underestimate the fact that they're going to look at this game as their shot. Right. I mean, this is, this is the, sh- this they're, they are Oh, and 15 and, and they're like, you know, they're probably going to get smacked by Washington on Thursday. Yeah. And so when we come to town on Saturday, um, it's us and then it's Stanford and that's the end of their regular season. And by golly, um, you better believe that they're going to be gunning for Washington State thinking this is this is the one that they can get that they have a legit shot at getting. Yeah, this is in football, Oregon State against WSU this year uh, before people. I mean, WSU is four and one coming in, but uh, uh, no one really knew if they were that good or not. And, right. and probably Oregon State had circled them on the calendar from early in the year. Like, this is where we're going to pull out all our tricks. This is where we're going to get our conference win. And obviously it didn't work out for them. Um, but, right. uh, but obviously uh, this WSU team is plenty bad enough to lose to a team who's playing with their hair on fire. And even regardless of how terrible they are and how bad their coach is, um, yeah, like I, I remember you mentioning that Ernie actually outcoached. Uh, that was one of the team. Well, he has he's done that a few times recently. He's, but uh, but I, I'm totally fine with you know if you're if you're listening, you know, even even though a loss to Cal is well within the realm of possibility, even like not at all unlikely. Uh, feel free to demand Ernie Kent to be fired right on the spot if, <laughs> if they do lose to Cal. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I mean, we'd probably like him fired on the spot anyway, but even if they win the game, but that you know, I mean, we really, really will want him fired at that point. I mean, do you really like people don't realize this? Like, I know you do because you're looking at this, but like Cal's adjusted defensive efficiency is 334th in the country. There are <laughs> like in what 353 teams? 353, and it's like. I like I don't know if I can properly express how bad that is. Like I I mean I, I think I've I if if a SWAC team 
has that, it's bad. I guess, yeah. which is the like, in case, like for our readers, that that is far and away the worst conference in 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 Division One basketball, the SWAC. It's it's easily the worst conference year in and year out. And so you expect them to have three hundreds, but you do not expect a power power conference team to have the three hundred thirty fourth ranked defense. The I mean, these are these are the teams. Okay, so you mentioned the SWAC. Well, the team that's ranked right below them, 335th, is Mississippi Valley State. Yeah. <laughs> the team that's ranked three spots above them is Southern, also a SWAC team. Um, yeah, it's – I mean, you look down at the bottom of this list, it's lots of uh, Big Sky, Big West, SWAC, uh, <laughs> MEAC, lots of MEACs down there oh, below yeah. them. I previewed the MEAC for three years. I know it well. Yeah. Guess who's worst? You want to know who's worst? The absolute worst. In the absolute country. worst. Oh, man. Uh, Look over the border. Look over the border. Eight miles to the east of Pullman, Washington. Idaho. 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 I. A-H-O. We're the worst defense in the country. Country, go. Oh, my God. Man. Just they, we should just have at the end of the year, like a, a seven game series of Idaho and WSU. Just I mean, to, not only that, they're like they're like a point. So uh, these these ratings on on Ken Palm do it, you know, per 100 points scored per 100 possessions. They are damn near a full point worse than the next team per 100 <laughs> possessions, and that's Incarnate Word. <laughs> This incarnate so bad. What's incarnate's word? Do they have a conference? What is their conference? Uh, I'm looking. Hold on. Hold on. I can tell you. Yes, they, they are. are. They are a Southland team. Oh, the Southland. South. We are shaking the Southland or something. The Southland, which you know is up there with the Miak and Swack. Just yeah, it is. It is. Anyway, so yeah, it should be impossible to have a defense that bad. Um, you know, if you're a high major team, you should be able to put together a top 200 defense by accident. You know, like like really, like without even just hardly because trying. Your guys are tall enough. Just like, because your guys are taller and more athletic. Yeah. And uh, so to be that bad at Cal, uh, that that to me, I, I know that you know Cal fans don't are, are real you know big fans of White King Jones right now and it's like yeah to me like like not even following the program and beyond the fact that their record is so bad I look at that one number and I go that guy can't coach like period like you you cannot like it's just I mean Ernie Kent's defenses aren't even close to that bad like if we're just kind of trying to put it in the proper context like they're not even close to that bad and yeah. they're bad and so they're bad and just to clarify something like when we're, when we're saying adjusted defensive efficiency, the 334th, that's adjusted to the teams they are playing. So right. the, the, they aren't playing harder teams and giving up more points than these, you know, SWAC and Southland teams. The, it's adjusted for that. And so that's to put, you know, the adjustment is to put, um, it's not perfect, but it does a pretty damn good job of putting the teams on an equal, kind of an equal playing field and, the, and then rating them that way. And, and and Cal, who who should be recruiting, you know, at least you know better than WSU, better than Oregon State, you know, who like oh, whoever. For sure. Um, they uh, they they should be recruiting. They should be no less than tenth in the pack, no worse than tenth in the Pac-12 in recruiting. Like and then they and but they're putting out these defenses, who who are just just plain like awful. And this like it's and, and that's what you said when when you're talking about Viking Johnson. And, that there's coaching involved in that. You can't, because they have better athletes. They have better players than any of those teams that are around them. They have to, and and so that they just to have that bad of a defense, it the, the there has to be coaching involved. Yep. And so exactly that's what we're talking about. Ernie his just god awful defense, and really like his decent offenses, but not like. He has decent offenses, but nothing, no elite offenses. Like he's never had an, an elite, not even like uh, he. I think he's flirted with the top 100 offense before, but at WSU, but not nothing like top 50 even. Not, you know, and so and even Tony Bennett's teams had better offensive rankings than Ernie's teams, and uh, they they were wasting all their energy on defense. So uh, yeah, this is uh, that's I'm trying to say this is coaching, um, uh, and. 
there, there are, uh, you know, I, I, I do want to point out there, there are people, you know, there's the people, you know, you, you, you want the co you know, you want the head coach gone, but the, the, um, the, the, the assistant coach game is rough for these guys. Um, you know, I know some of them have went through multiple, uh, coaching head coaching changes and bounced around. So, um, it's a bummer for them, but they're not the ones making $1.4 million a year. So, yeah, that is 100% true. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, on that note, just remember WC did win a game this weekend. Um, yeah. Yeah. Celebrate. <laughs> like, party. I also, that was a fun college basketball game to watch because it was it actually was. Forth. the offense was good enough. You know, there there wasn't too many turnovers. There was turnovers, but like it wasn't it wasn't a mess. And there was a cool, you know, there there was uh that that put back late that put him up was really cool. Uh, that you know Wade with Wade and Cannon just battling for the you know poking the rebounds up and down. Um, yeah, that was a really fun game to watch. So um, it, it's nice to still have those mixed in um, <laughs> with with you know you get rewarded a little bit you know following yeah. This um yep. but yeah yeah so but that's college basketball it doesn't like you know it, it happens so, you know uh, they say in nfl any given sunday but college basketball is uh you that's know, crazy. definitely true yeah um so yeah so uh it's enough about basketball i think uh so let's, let's here, talk some liberal politics yeah let's let's go into our west coast elite or coastal elites uh section um, where we uh, re- rip off our masks to reveal um, snowflakes. Uh, That's right. Uh, so, you know, as we say, if you don't want to hear none of that, uh, just fast forward. I don't know. We usually do this for 20 or 30 minutes, um, and, and, and you'll miss all of it. Um, the first part, though, is not really politics. So I'm doing this, our very first reader request, Jeff. Um, we, we, have, we have fans. Uh, one we have one. one fan although i will say i saw that we have now like five five star reviews on itunes which was like that that put a smile on my Thank face you. today while i was Thank yelling you. at some kid about not doing his homework so that was Keep great it will happen um we out here uh yeah uh but uh so um i'm gonna be honest it's not a topic i really wanted to talk that much about but uh, so, um, in this reader's, uh, this reader pointed out uh, when uh, Robert Kraft uh, was busted for, uh, you know, we, we saw a prostitution, prostitution charge. And so, if you just read the, the, um, if you just read the headline, it, it, you, you can maybe chuckle a bit. You're like, ah, you know, screw that guy, you know, billionaire, um, paying for sex at some skeezy strip mall, whatever. But really, when you d- dig into it, it's not funny. It's uh, it, it's it relates to a very serious and terrifying kind of issue in the U.S. in the world of uh, human trafficking. Um, it, uh, it's you know it, it kind of took all the all the um, a- any sort of like you know joy of seeing a billionaire get his uh, uh, just to being like this is serious and this is disgusting and this is horrifying especially if you have kids um especially if you have daughters um to see you know a, a place like this a seedy place where they're um uh i don't know at, you know at least some or however many are girls that are uh kidnapped and essentially forced to be there yeah it's uh, you know people think we don't have slavery anymore and we actually do and this is this is the form that it uh, most commonly takes, uh, you know, where, um, you know, women or young, sometimes, you know, very, very young women um, are, you know, possessed by, you know, somebody, uh, you know, some kind of, of trafficker, a pimp or whatever. Um, and then and then forced into, you know, some sort of servitude um, that they can't get out of. So um, while, yeah, you know, <laughs> we totally kind of want to laugh at Robert Kraft and you know, point at him and be like, ha ha Patriots, you get what you deserve, which there, there is a part of that. I mean, there's, you know, yes, I'm 
you know, but it, but it's hard to take too much glee in it. Um, you know, the personal embarrassment to him is, is sort of backseat to the to the larger issue, which is, yeah, we, we have a problem in this country of women being trafficked and, uh, um, you know, that he was caught up in a, a trafficking investigation, I think just just kind of makes it. Um, you know, that much worse. And, and, you know, and the reality is um, human trafficking would not be a thing if there wasn't a market for the trafficked women. And so um, I guess that's the part where, you know, I don't really laugh at craft because it's like, you know, I mean, if, if he was not, um, you know, participating in that, there wouldn't be a market. And if there's no market, there's no women, you know, being, uh, you know, having their lives taken away from them. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, if, if anybody's ever interested in that, um, you know, looking up a little bit, a little deeper into human trafficking in the United States, um, it is a far, far bigger problem than I think, uh, you know, the vast, vast majority of the country realizes. Um, and it's, it's a very difficult thing for, uh, to prosecute. So, um, yeah, it's, and, it, and it's a problem, not just in our country, it's a problem around the world. Um, and, and in, you know, uh, other countries, um, you know, it gets even worse, you know, with, uh, with children, um, uh, anyway. So yeah, you know, if you're, if you're at all curious about it, um, there's lots of information out there on it and it really is, uh, really is a worldwide epidemic. Yeah. Um, and, uh, fuck you, Robert Kraft. So that's right. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, all I wanted to really say on that. Um, uh, I hope he gets whatever is coming to him there um and whoever else is involved uh so yep. uh, yeah they uh, go away for a long time yeah maybe i don't know shoot him in the dick or something yeah fair enough yeah i think uh, that's deserved yeah well there'd be no more reason for him to go back to those places if that happens so that's right you know see look Just at go, these liberals go medieval these liberals advocated in these that's cool right capital and, punishment well, that, yeah yeah <laughs> okay that was funny see we're all the same when something else that was funny tra- when it comes to sex trafficking we should all be the same yeah yeah something else that was funny uh michael cohen getting in front of congress today and testifying oh man uh so um i admit i i haven't uh delved into this too deeply uh but uh i did read his opening statement in full which you know, it's it's one of those things where like, yeah, this is some pretty like damning stuff for like a sitting president. But also it's like, does it even matter? Does it even move the needle? We like we uh we all knew these things about him. Yeah. Yeah. Um I mean there's definitely <laughs> things that he said where I'm like, didn't we already know that? But well, I guess it's different you know, hearing it from him, right? From that source it's different. But at the same right. time, Jeff, do you think uh do you think this moves the needle with any certain groups? It seems like it's already the people that have made their judgments on Trump either way. And that's, it's not going to move them either way. Right. You know, yeah. If, if, if so, if, you know, he's uh, kind of the most interesting thing is he's, he's saying, it, you know, Trump knew about the, you know, he knew from Julian Assange, the, the WikiLeaks uh, release of the, you know, the Democratic National Committee documents. And um, that's, you know, whatever. I don't know if even what can be done about that. But it's, you know, there's some I, I, I'm I'm positive that if that is something that Robert Mueller already knows about. So, um, you know, it's basically him just it doesn't look, you know, it shouldn't look good for Trump. But there's a lot of things that shouldn't look good for Trump that it just doesn't matter. Like it just doesn't matter to his base. Right. Yeah. It's, it, you know, as I was listening to it, I kind of thought, um, you know, I, what was most interesting to me was sort of the, uh, and I guess what gave it some credibility, um, was, was it was just sort of the candid, um, you know, observations, the little like, you know, kind of peek behind the curtain kind of things. Yeah. Um, you know, there were obviously some things where, like we said, you know, you peek behind the curtain and it's like, well, duh, you know, like, like you talked about how, you know, Trump viewed, um, running for president as a, basically a publicity stunt to to build the brand and that he didn't expect to win. It's like, well, I I think we all kind of knew that. Um, but you know, when he talked about things like, you know, the, the president, you know, asking him to lie to the first lady and, you know, she's a very nice woman who didn't deserve that. And, you know, it's just kind of those, those little, I don't know, there were just these little details that kind of, 
um, seemed to lend a little more credibility to some of the things um, that he was saying. I, you know, I don't know that you know, any of the, the proof that he offered was, was somehow, you know, super damning, um, you know, obviously still nothing, you know, that he, he doesn't have anything to directly tie anybody to, to Russia or whatever, but, um, but, you know, definitely kind of interesting. And, and, and I guess like the biggest thing is, um, you know, I mean, what, you know, what's his motive for doing this, right? I mean, he's not getting a deal. He's already going to prison, you yeah. know, so what, you know, and I know that the Republicans wanted to continually sort of cast him as a, as a guy who um, was a liar and a, and a cheat himself and shouldn't be believed. And it's like, okay, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's true, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I mean, I, I mean, really the only motive here would be vengeance, right. You know, to, to try, you know, he was mad at Trump about something, you know, being, and if we're, we're being logical, maybe just, you know, being hung out to dry. Right. Um, as, as his fixer. And, you know, so then he ends up, you know, okay, so he's, he's going to go back at him, but it's like, you know, I mean, that's, uh, I don't know, like that to me, that's, that's not, that, that doesn't cast as much doubt on the testimony as say, like, I don't know, like a, like a, a witness who has struck a deal with the government and is for their testimony. Right. right. Um, you know, this is a guy who's going to prison no matter what he said today or any other day, you know, so I mean, maybe he just wants to cause pain for Trump, which I suppose is entirely possible since it seems like he was kind of used up like a piece of toilet paper. But um, still, I think I think it does lend a little weight to what he's saying in general. And, and you know, and I think um, overall with with all these investigations, I know the, the Mueller report's supposed to be done pretty soon. Um, you know, I think all of it, I, I don't think there's ever going to be any smoking gun. Like, I, I just don't, I, you know, people have yeah. always been wanting the smoking gun. I just, that's just not real. I mean, you're not going to find tapes. You're not going to find the Nixon tapes. Like that's not, that's not going to happen here. And, uh, so what you really, I think have to do is kind of look at the totality of the evidence. And, and I think this is, you know, one more, one more thing in that direction. Yeah. And I think, the it was interesting how the, um, you know, the, the Congress, Congress folk, uh, responded to, you know, the questions they were asking. I think you saw a lot of like essential filibustering from the Republicans, uh, during their time, you know, each, each person, each person on the committee gets in each, you know, Congress person gets a set amount of minutes, uh, to ask questions. And, uh, you saw a lot of, you know, just, uh, not asking any sort of insightful questions, just essentially trying to accuse him of lying, being a liar and, and all that, which is unfortunate. And it's, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these hearings turn into a farce um, pretty quickly. Um, I will say like, um, let, me, let me put my super liberal hat on. Um, I wasn't, pre I did see um, um, ALC's, uh, line of questioning it was very it was just very professional very straightforward um just only about you know asking about facts asking about uh names you know other people that could you know if uh, michael cohen can provide the information who else could provide the information um getting actual names and, and you know uh yes or no questions not things where someone could ramble and 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 uh, delay um uh so uh, very um impressive set of questions from her whatever you think about her uh she handled that much more professionally than uh some of her uh, more experienced colleagues um and then you know it it's these these things like i said just turn into you know posturing and and uh and it's just it, it gets old um which is i'm glad that cohen made such a detailed and um um uh opening statement uh because there wasn't really much after that so yeah that um that's uh that's probably enough on on uh that cohen stuff it, i think it'll probably not matter uh, probably not much in the grand scheme of things <laughs> <laughs> probably i mean is anything gonna matter like never, like i don't never, know i mean never. really he's i mean are we in agreement that impeachment is just not happening oh, yeah. in this term i mean if he yeah. gets reelected, maybe that yeah, would be on it, the table, but it's not happening this term. If you really, really want him out, please vote him out. Vote, please vote. Yeah, that's so that's easy. that's all that's all it is to it. Like you don't don't be wish like there are these people that just fully expect impeachment, fully expect to be arrested and hold off handcuffs yeah. in prison. Yeah, that um, happen. We it's 2019. He <laughs> we're we're deep into this thing. It's not going to happen. 
uh, it's not going to happen. Um, don't don't get your hopes on that on that. Just you know, do whatever you can do to make sure that he is not reelected, oh. if that's what you want. Um, that's right. Vote. Um, so yeah, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, we can talk about a little bit about pop culture now. Um, I what uh, Amanda and I have a kind of tradition of hate watching the Oscars. Um, we kind of slacked on it this year. We only caught it about halfway through. Um, but we, we've we've uh, watched the full like four hour BS marathons, only knowing about a quarter of the movies at best, like <laughs> or of what's going on. Um, you know, looking up whatever you know, who, who who is this actress? What was she in? I don't even know what this is. Um, but uh, you know, uh, the uh, the the winner of best picture this year, um, which it was an interesting uh, set of nominees for sure, and. Uh, uh, the winner of Best Picture uh, kind of uh, had the general idea of a lot of what you saw from this um, uh, uh, set, this set of awards, uh, uh, kind of this um, idea of uh, uh, looking back at, or looking back at, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, racism and and uh, things like that, and and. Uh, even even in Black Panther, which was nominated for Best Picture, and, and uh, uh, Black Klansmen um, also, and and so, but then you, you saw another uh, one, which um, a Green Book, which was uh, a, a, a movie about um, the racism endured uh, by uh, an African American uh, jazz pianist. Uh, in in the in the deep south which had a white um lead and was directed and produced by a a group of mostly white men um so uh it obviously received quite a bit of criticism for how the uh kind of uh how kind of how the how racism was portrayed Um, um i haven't seen the movie uh i kind of read enough reviews to the point where i'm not I didn't want to bother spending the time on it. Um, but Jeff, I know that you saw it, so I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, and, and part of what's funny is that I don't see a lot of movies. Um, and in fact, I'll talk about Black Panther in a minute, but I only saw Black Panther last weekend <laughs> on Netflix. So uh, if that tells you kind of where, where I'm at with my movie watching, but occasionally Sarah and I get to go out for a movie. And, um, you know, when we're talking about, well, what do we want to go see? Well, you know, we kind of looked at, uh, Green Book, and we, you know, I just kind of looked up um, kind of how it was reviewed, and it, it seemed to be mostly well received, and right. um, you know, and, and it was a, it was a story about race, and um, you know, kind of the older I get, the more um, the more interested I get in in race dynamics, and and more on the end of sort of feeling very um, inadequate. <laughs> you know, right. um, in terms of understanding it and, uh, and, and my role in, in it, especially as an educator, um, you know, kind of seeing where, where, where I fit with, um, you know, doing what I can do to, to make this a more, uh, equitable, um, society. But, you know, so I saw it, I thought, okay, you know, let, let's go watch it. And, and, you know, and as I, as I watched it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's ostensibly, like you said, the movie is ostensibly about, you know, the racism that this pianist endures in the South. Um, but that's not what it's really about. Um, it's, it's really, a, a pretty classic. And, and, um, the term I heard used, I was listening to the New York times daily, the, the daily podcast. Um, I listen to that most days and, uh, they had, you know, a, a culture movie critic guy come on and, and kind of talk about it. And he said, you know, that Hollywood's got a long tradition of these, these racial reconciliation movies, um, yeah. where, yeah. Yeah, where the, the other term that I, I saw used, which is a little harsher, is the white savior. Yeah, that's another way to put it yeah. for sure. Um, and so you know, the white racist um, is is saved by their their black counterpart um, in some way. And you know, in this movie, or, obviously, is around where the uh, the white racist saves the black person and shows and his, he, cause, you know he's. I've seen a few of the scenes where you know like. He steps in. It's the classic, like, right. steps in at the bar. Hey, he's okay. He's with me type thing. Right. There's actually a pretty funny, like, um, if you see, uh, I don't watch Seth Meyers' show very much, but I saw it pop up. They did a they did a little spoof 
like video where it's like a movie called White Savior and and uh if if you've ever seen movies like uh Hidden Figures and uh yeah. The Blind Side and stuff like that, you'll 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 get a lot of references. Or The Help. The yeah, Help. Yeah, like movie like that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, as I'm as, as I'm watching the movie, I, I'm kind of watching this unfold. And like you said, and 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 it tries to portray it kind of as this two way street, right? That like um, each each character is getting something out of this relationship, and um, but you know, in the movie, you know, the white guys. I mean, he's really the hero. He's the protagonist. He's the hero. Um, you know, I kept waiting for something for him to make a bad decision somewhere, and he never does. <laughs> you know, and it's like um, every you know every movie he makes is the right one, and he's you know ultra um patient you know you talk about uh there, there was one scene where where the pianist uh, dr don shirley dr shirley um where he you know gets totally hammered and and you know he has to be rescued because he's getting beat up at a bar in the deep south um you know by some by some uh you know clansmen racist dudes um you know there's another scene where um dr shirley um you know has a homosexual encounter at the ymca with somebody gets caught and of course this is you know 19 whatever deep south and the cops want to you know haul him into you know it's just anyway but you know the the white guy you know he's tony saves him right and so it's just i don't know man i just like as i'm and, and you know and tony teaches him how to eat fried chicken it's like that. Yeah. That's one of the scenes. It's yeah, like right. you're. So yeah, I just kind of kept waiting for it to get a little more complex, you know, and to sort of um, respect the complexity of race dynamics, and it and it never does. And um, you know, when I got to the end, I just was kind of like, I mean, it's nice, but um, yeah, you know, I just like had this uneasy feeling, like eh, like I what did I just watch, you know? And then to kind of see some of the reactions after Green Book one. Um, I, I guess sort of like validated some of those feelings I was having where I was like, yeah, like that just feels very um, like, like this is an antiquated notion of race. And, you know, the, the podcast I was do the daily, the guy was talking about, it's really just kind of driving Miss Daisy, but in reverse, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, that movie was 30 years ago. So, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's a bummer. And Black Panther, so let's talk about Black Panther for a sec, because I, I would have loved it if Black Panther had won. And I know people think of it as a superhero movie, but, I mean, some of the race dynamics in that, and, and I'll let you talk to that, but but um, what a powerful, cool movie. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, um, first of all, to have a superhero movie, uh, which is a blockbuster superhero movie, where uh, significant the significant portion of the the uh, cast is is black and um i mean i they 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 definitely like leaned into that and made sure that that was the case and and i and i was impressed for you know for a movie that is meant to um be uh sent to such a large audience where green book wasn't really meant to be like that uh but but black panther um there's some very like uh explicit and i'm not saying explicit in the way of like curse words or whatever i'm saying like they explicitly uh, addressed um like it, they had uh the michael b jordan's character like literally state you know um uh you know rate ra like racial inequality and, and 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 state like and it was to me it was a, a little bit of a an allegory of like the Martin Luther King approach to the Malcolm X approach. Um, and even you saw that the, even as, uh, um, they're fighting, there's like a mutual respect, especially from, uh, the black Panther character. Um, I can't remember the character's names now, but, um, to Michael B. Jordan's character, there, there's, there's some respect and, but they they have a difference in opinions on how to you know obviously approach the um the you know the the sort of the the, the racial question that they're facing and but then you see that uh there's influence on on uh, that the Michael B Jordan's character has in the end because uh uh they they because he wants to take uh Wakanda to the world and because you know, it's just like secret society essentially you know not really they're they're a part of greater society but they're kind of hiding they're they're letting people believe that they're a third world country and and all that up until up until 
you know, the end of this movie. So you see the influence that they have. And, and there's definitely some, yeah, the, you're, you're looking at Oakland in the early 90s and, and all this stuff. And you're getting this like tiny glimpses into things. Um, to do that in a movie that is meant for the masses is, is fairly brave. And, and, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it, they do that and then it's fun and, and it's cool. And so, you know, and, and your kids are watching it. So there's, there's a message there for them. So it's cool. So if they wanted to, it's cool. They got nominated for best picture. I think that's huge. Um, Honestly, um, I don't know if you've I've, have you seen Black Klansman? I have not, but I'm going to. I'm going to make sure I see it wherever wherever it ends up that I can see it. Um, I, I definitely want to, and and I'm actually kind of, you know, like I said, I'm not not a big movie person, but um, it, it kind of makes me also want to go back and, um, you know, maybe watch some of the some of the older Spike Lee joints and, and just kind of see, um, you know, like like says I've become more aware of of kind of my place in this whole thing um you know maybe one of the things i've you know tried to be committed to is is seeing things from another perspective trying to understand like what this looks like and not not in a sense of um trying to you know become some kind of expert or anything but also but understanding that um you know my experience is shaped by you know me moving through the world as a as a as a white man um you know, and, and really trying to take in as much as I can of what other people, um, how they experience the world, how they say they see it and, and, and the art that they create, um, as they see the world, um, trying to understand, you know, how they move through the world and, and maybe through that I can, you know, be a better person, be a better educator. Yeah. Um, Black Klansman really, that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you want to see it. I, I think it's very good. Um, it's funny. Uh, it's entertaining. Um, you know, it's, uh, the few Spike Lee movies I've seen, uh, it's, it's along that line. So, but, um, but it's, uh, it's got a good lead and, and, um, Adam Driver is a good, uh, supporting actor. You know, that there's a whole dynamic of, um, uh, and it's got a, it's got a similar dynamic almost to Black Panther where, uh, without giving away too much, there's this other character who, um, so essentially, I don't think I'm giving away by saying the central premise of it is, is this uh, poli- uh, black police officer in Colorado who is um, basically uh, tricking the local KKK group into believing that he is this white man and that's going to sign up. So they send his white um, coworker off to to pose as him and then he would talk to them on the phone and it's a true story they definitely embellish some things there's a few things in there that aren't true um but uh but uh that's a movie you know what do you what do you expect um, right. um there's definitely the whole ending is not what happened at all um but it's far more satisfying than what actually happened so um uh but there's uh, there, you know, he, he's interacting with these, like, basically, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Black Power, Black Panther, um, uh, college students, um, and, and they, they're, and then, so they, you know, they have their opinions on the police and how they're horrible. And so, you know, and he's a police officer, so he, um, he, he has his own way of doing things, you know, he has this belief of changing things from within and, um, David Duke is a character in the movie because he was a character in the actual um, book that was written, uh, the, the the true story. Um, so it's it's pretty interesting. I, I think it it's 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 well done, and and obviously there's some very obvious uh, connections to um, kind of our current reality, uh, even though it's a movie set in the 70s, um, uh, which I, I think. Uh, Spike Lee won an Oscar for adapted screenplay, I believe, uh, um, which I think was his first Oscar. Um, yeah, first competitive Oscar. First, first one he won in a competitive category. Yeah. And so uh, I think it was well-deserved, and it's a very enjoyable movie. I would recommend it. This was – I felt pretty good uh, for uh, this year. I think I had seen three or so of the nominees, um, and – it, it, it's funny we I would have seen four but we the night before we or the week before we had 
we we had decided to rent either um uh the Melissa McCarthy movie, uh which is also based on true story, uh um Will You Ever Forgive Me or something like that, which is excellent movie. Highly recommend it. It's about a um a lady who she was nominated for uh, best actress for it. Um uh it's a it's a, a woman who uh plagiarized who basically um made up uh uh uh, letters by famous authors um, and sold them as if they were real um, and had like no remorse over it whatsoever. Um, so it was uh, it was pretty good and, and she does a great job. Uh, but also, we so we were going to see Star is Born, but that looks that look sad as fuck. And you already heard what it is. It says. is. Oh, it is. But Let me tell the, you. The other movie. The I, music's killer, but. Yeah. The it's other sad. movie, I saw, which I felt just wasn't really, was really very out of place, was. Uh, was Bohemian Rhapsody, which has an excellent lead. I, you know, I think Robbie Malek, he, he won Best Actor, and I'm no expert, but I'm like, hey, I thought he was really good in that. Um, so sure, you know, win and good for you, man. I love you and Mr. Robot. Just keep making that though. Stop making movies. Um, but uh, but the movie itself, it was pretty funny. It before like. There, there was a lot of uh, memes on the internet or people making fun of the editing in, in a certain scene in the movie, um, which is kind of um, exemplifies a lot of the editing in the rest of the movie, um, where it's a lot of jump cuts and like ridiculous amounts of like cuts to different guys' faces, basically nodding to whatever whoever's talking, and um, it, it did win best editing, which was you know a, made fun of heavily on the internet. But I, just, you know, it's it has a good lead, but the movie itself wasn't that great. Like I thought, you know, they they do this like twenty minute sequence of the Live Aid perform the Queen's uh, Live Aid performance, like that's on the internet, you know. Like we can all watch the real performance and the CGI Wembley Stadium and the uh, Freddie, like the fake Freddie Mercury, is is not as good as like the you know, the grainy 1980s video of, like, of the yeah. actual performance. So, like, why did you feel the need to... Did you just want to kill some time? Like, why did you feel the need to do that? And so, but, so I, I was watching, like, yeah, it's fun. They're singing the songs, but this is a really weird thing to put in a movie. Like, there's right. no... Like, there's there's nothing driving the plot. Like, there, there's, there's, there's no point to it, really. You could have said, like, you could have had, like, maybe one song and then and then you know had him talk about how it was great instead of but it was more of like you you accepted like if you're coming into that movie you already knew that um that queen is well known for that being one of like the best performances of all time or whatever and so but uh so it's almost like then why did you do it if you already assumed that we knew that already uh yeah. Uh, but yeah it's uh uh that that was one of the things that their portrayal of his uh, gayness was, um, I've read more about it, but I didn't read any about it before I watched it. And then uh, uh, I, it, 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 it was kind of strange and very kind of backwards the way they kind of presented it as like the downfall of him. Um, and these very portrayal of like, like go, he, there's this one part he goes to a gay bar and it's just a whole bunch of gay stereotypes like flashing on the screen. And you're like, seriously, like, this is what we're doing. Like, you guys, like, aren't putting it. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things you wonder how it ended up getting nominated. But, <laughs> yeah. but you know, get, probably because of Rami Malek, he did a great job and um, whatever. I don't really know that much about movies. I'm just giving my. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, you know, I thought it was okay, but not I, great. I don't know shit about cinematography. That's right. I don't know anything about, I mean. The editing thing, once they point it out, you're like, holy shit, yeah, this is making me sick. But, like, I wouldn't, like, I probably wouldn't have noticed it that much if other people haven't pointed it out. I've been, you know, I just, I came away from the movie and be like, that was pretty good. You know, it was fun to watch because Queen's music is good. And like, <laughs> like uh, and, and so, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that was a, a pop culture conversation. I think we were like, in our element because yeah I'm sure that green book was made for like almost 40 year old white dudes dude so yeah i think that was right in your alley yeah and uh and and i'm like no no not that good 
it was kind of <laughs> nice. It's kind of nice to be uh, to be agreed with by a bunch of people that are supposed to be experts. That's that kind of cool. Yeah, there you go. That always feels well, good. You know, it does have eighty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so you're agreed with by twenty percent of the experts. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, so all the people who were ripping it at the Academy Awards, Spike Lee, I agree, you know, Spike Lee agreed with me, so, I mean, that, you know, I mean, I'm doing pretty good at that point. I think there was a shot of um, Chadwick, Chadwick Bose, what was his name? Chadwick, who play, who plays Black Panther? Um, I t- yeah, I totally forget his name, too. It's Chadwick Boseman? Pop culture, um, but yeah, he, he, look at us. Kind of, kind of his look when uh, Green Book won is pretty classic. But um, yeah, um, but Mahershala Ali is cool, and he he's played, a really good actor. I'm just kind of surprised that he. Yeah, I'm, I haven't watched the, took that uh, role. I haven't watched the uh, uh, the True Detective with him, uh, but I, I'm, I look forward to watching that. I think the season's over now, so um, yeah. I have my. HBO Go free with my AT and T subscription, so yeah, pretty, they just added it without like really you added it and I didn't even add like that's you just weird. gave like, me something. Kind of a weird sales tactic is that? Yeah, um, Verizon definitely didn't do that with me, and I just bought two new phones from them. Yeah, and what the hell? It's okay. I have had much pain with AT and T over the years, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was about damn time. Yeah. I got it's stuff. a give and take, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, um but yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah, he's a good he's a good actor and yeah. apparently a pretty good basketball player. Yeah. Played for I think Ernie. he was he played, played for Ernie at St. Mary's <laughs> and decided college basketball sucked so bad he was going to quit. Yeah. Well, he played all four years. <laughs> good job, Ernie. He played all four years. I'm I'm uh I'm sure Ernie will take credit for his acting, so Oh yeah, and I'm just I'm disappointed. I has he had a press conference this week? Did anyone ask him about it? Maybe I missed it. That would have been my yeah. only question. That would have been a great question. Like how much of I how much after. of his how much of his success as an actor does he owe to you? All of it or most of it? I don't know. Yeah, the act <laughs> so interested in practice. Yeah. Did your kids do anything funny this week? Kids, kid, you have one kid. I have kids. You have one kid. Did your kid do anything funny? Well, um, you know, B had a couple appointments. She had her first dentist appointment. Ooh. Which, um, How many teeth does she have? Uh, she has a fuck ton of teeth. I don't know. Like, a lot. She's only pretty much only has her molars to go. Watch your fingers. Oh, I know. I already do. Dude, she got her first teeth at <laughs> five, like, not even five months. Poor man. Oh. Bless her. Oh. Cool. Like, it, <laughs> oh, dear um, God. Yeah, so she had she had a bunch of teeth by the time she was one, and now she's over like more than fifteen months. So right. Um. So she had her doctor dentist appointment. Um. We used to be able to brush her teeth really easy, but now she's getting independent. She wants to grab the toothbrush and do it herself. So we literally have to hold her down because now we've been you know put the fear the dentist put the fear of God in us about brushing the teeth. Mm-hmm. So, so now we're like holding her down, and it's like a She's screaming and yelling, and we're singing the song, so she's like half laughing, and then and then like two seconds later, like as soon as we let her go, she's all happy and she's brushing her own teeth, and we're singing the song, and Amanda looks at me and goes, "What have we become?" Brush our teeth, brush our teeth, brush our teeth. This is it's like, oh my god, like, who are we? It used to be so cool. We were never, but we used to, you know. Oh, you know, listen to indie music and whatever. I don't know. This is the way we brush our teeth. Yeah. But uh, so you know, that was funny. Uh, she went to she had her 15 uh, month doctor appointment. Um, as far as her development, speech, and everything is going, doctor said she was more than perfect. So she's still a shrimp though. She's a shrimp baby. Which how? I, I know. How? How? She's, okay, so I mean. Not, 15th percentile of her height. Good Lord. Okay, so, I, I mean, we need to say this because there are lots of our listeners who have never met you, yeah. obviously. Um, how tall are you, Craig? Six foot five. It, yeah. <laughs> and Amanda's not short. 
Uh, she's like, yeah, she's average, like five foot six. I mean, she's average, but she's not short. But you like, know, so just going by the calculations, like she should like B should turn out to be five foot ten or something. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, or five eleven even. But That's you know, I wild. You know, but Amanda does have a five foot one mom, so we're kind of thinking. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, the gene from her. There uh, you go. Which that honestly, sounds unfortunate. I think. Well, I think life as a as a woman might be easier five foot one than five foot eleven. So. Yeah, I think life as a man would be probably easy. Like, like I don't know. Like it, when when I see someone your height, I think God, that would have been so rad to be like six five. But then I'll bet you sit there and go like when you're like on an airplane and you're like God, it would have been so rad to be six feet tall. No, no, I'm no. Not. It's way better to be six. No feet. way, dude. This is rad. Dude, I love I, this. When I, when I was younger, I could dunk the ball with two hands. Like it was freaking great. Like, like I know so many people have never dunked a ball well before i used to do it casually if i would just lose a few pounds i could probably i can still do it but it, you know it's a it's a it, no being tall is great I, I can i can deal with the planes i it's everything else about it. i can deal with like you know i just have like permanent like scars on my head from hitting stuff so much but there's so many other benefits <laughs> to being tall um no one ever like I, I'm, i've always been a very passive person but no one ever picked fights with me because I was enormous. I've walked through the worst neighborhoods of like Brooklyn and Queens, and no one t- no one bothers me because I'm enormous. Because <laughs> you're large. Yeah, like they probably think I could beat them, but I definitely uh... can't. Like if you start fighting me, I will run away. And if you catch <laughs> it, a lot of punches in, like it's not like because I've never had to fight any. I like a couple uh... times in my life, like it just hasn't happened much. So uh... you know. So it's you know there's a lot of benefits being six foot five. I'm I, I ain't complaining, man. Like I ain't compl- all right. Well, thanks for making me feel bad about it all over again. I appreciate that. Hey, you know it's okay. That's uh, okay. Now I've reached the point where I'm shrinking. Have, to have so. short man syndrome or whatever. So you, you're still six foot. It's good. Yeah. It's above average. Yeah, and it's uh, it's only a matter of time before my my children pass me. So. Oh yeah, your your oldest is gonna. It's, 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 my oldest is uh, a large boy. Uh, it might happen next month. I don't know. Yeah, he turns twelve on Saturday, and he's, he might uh, be, end up as tall as me. I don't know. Yeah, he he's he turns twelve on Saturday, and he's already he's about five foot five. So. Yeah, uh, I, was, yeah. I was when I was twelve. I was five foot four. And there was a lot of kids that were actually taller than me. And then between the uh, between the um, start of seventh grade, which I had my physical for like football or whatever, and then the end of eighth grade, I went from five foot four to six foot one. Ugh. So I was a goofy motherfucker. Holy like, crap! And then and then I, I and then I grew to six foot four by the end of high school, and then I gained another inch in college. So. Yeah, so now that's that's how I ended up where I am today. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so yeah, it, you know, it was tough to be in like try to do anything athletic when your limbs are just growing like you can feel them. <laughs> but I, I have more story. I have another story. It's not kid related, but it's like for all y'all that are like, I got my fur babies. Um, so as I'm sure a lot of our readers know, I have a fur baby. Uh, named, yes, you do. And he, Baxter, and he has a, a a companion named Schooner. So they, uh, I have two dogs. Um, Schooner has uh, been on the Baxter's beer of the game a few times, filled in for Bax when Bax was uh, um, injured. Uh, you know, and uh, but uh, today, um. I, you know, I put them out every morning to the backyard and they play around. They'll play around for one hour, two hours, whatever. But they'll start barking at me when they want to come back in. Uh, today, you know, I was just, I was working. I, I didn't, I wasn't really noticing what time it was. And I get a call from a Tacoma number. And I don't know if, I'm sure all of you have had the same issue. Uh, the spam numbers, like, just like, they, they just like do numbers that like look for, like places around you. Like the, it'll be pl- places that match your phone number, or places that are match places that you've been. So I just straight up don't answer any calls anymore if I don't know the number. But they called a second time, like really quick. So I pick up the phone and, and it's like, 
it's coming from a vet hospital. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, wait, did, do we have a bill? I don't, I don't recall taking the, no, like, do, are you missing your dog? And I'm like, <laughs> so I flip out. I'm, I'm, I'm like, what? Oh my God. I don't think so. Oh but maybe. And then I, I go out, I look in the backyard, the gate, back gate has swung open. No dogs. Oh no. So I'm flipping out. And I'm like, yeah. And then, but but when I'm flipping out, I was like, no, no, no. I'm missing two dogs. And she's like, we have, like, what are their names? And I'm like, Baxter and Schooner. She's like, we have them both here. Oh, my gosh. Someone found them and picked them up. Baxter didn't have, Baxter uh, just, he has his harness on, but he didn't have, he can't wear a collar anymore. Um, well, because we, well, we can't use his leash with a collar on him anymore because he had some neck issues, but. So he didn't have his collar on, so he didn't have his, um, uh, you know, identification. Schooner did. He had our, our, our phone numbers on there, but they scanned their microchips, and that's how they, uh, because they couldn't, they didn't see Schooner's uh, name tag at first. So they scanned our microchip, the microchips, and they were able to find our phone numbers. And they called us both, and Amanda was at work. She didn't answer, so um, I'm, I'm working, but I'm at home, so I'm like, whatever. Um, so I answered the phone, and uh, and flipped out and went and picked them up and uh some saint angel hero whatever you want to call her i don't know who she is she's uh you know they, they told me she was like in her early 20s girl that saw them walking on sixth avenue which Jeff, oh my gosh yeah like walking around sixth avenue which is one of the busiest roads in- uh yeah that would be a that, that's a death trap for a dog that's uh, not aware of their surroundings horrifying yeah. So that's why I said this person's a hero. Picked them yeah. up, took them to uh, the uh, vet in Proctor, which is about a mile from my house. And and so they did. I didn't even know they were. So there wasn't a lot of fret involved for me because I didn't even know they were gone until. I <laughs> um. So. So you, you you had like five seconds of panic. Yeah. When it could have been like you know minutes or hours of panic, right? Yeah, and so I'm just glad they stayed together, man. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, like, gosh, because if if one of them would have been found, and I I was thinking, like, if I realized they were gone, like, I would have to, like, I don't know, I probably would have had to, like, put me in her crib and then run out the door, like, because I'm not going to, like, carry her around and stick that, you know, and if she's in the crib, like, if, if, if she's in, like, a stroller, I might have to leave her to go, like, leave her on the sidewalk to go grab a dog if he's running out in the street. So I'm like thinking if, if I would have hurt, if I would have known they were gone, I would literally just have to like put her in the crib and leave her in the house, you know, because it would have been the safest option, um, yeah. which is, you know, someone might consider you to be a bad parent if you did that. I don't know. Uh, but so I'm just glad that I, that everything turned out fine. And I'm glad that I didn't have to go through that stress of looking for them. And I'm, I'm very thankful for this wonderful person who I wish she would have left her contact information so no that kidding. I could thank her in person and, you know, shower her with gifts and thank yous. And, but, you know, she was such a nice person. She didn't care about any of that. She just, you know, found these, like how many times you see a dog on the street, do you always stop and pick them up? Like, that's pretty cool. Maybe because they're little dogs. Like, so, people, <laughs> you know, if it's a big pit bull or something, you're not gonna be like, yeah, I'll leave them be, but, but yeah, it was very nice of her. Uh, that was my. I, but the bonus was, which I haven't been too mad at Schooner and Baxter for running off, because I got to cancel two work calls in that. You know, with you know I had the urgent excuse, so I was like, yes, two meetings that I don't have to do. So that was excellent. Yeah. So how about you, Jeff? You got any kiddo stories? No. <laughs> it was a boring week around the Nooser house. Um, I don't know, maybe I should make up a story about my children running away and somebody finding them and taking them to a doctor and then calling me, are your children missing? Are your children know. microchipped? <laughs> oh, by the way, well... I... <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, uh, you know, basically the most exciting thing we've got going on around here is, uh, we are, we are getting into, uh, we're in the middle of our festival of birthdays. Um, in our house. So Sarah's birthday is on uh, February 4th. My dad's birthday is February 6th. Uh, Atticus's birthday, my youngest, is February 29th. Yes, he's a leap year baby. 
my oldest son's birthday is on March 2nd and my birthday is on March 13th. So it's uh, we, we got a lot of birthdays happening. And so this weekend is birthday weekend for Atticus and Joshua. And uh, thank goodness neither one of them actually wants a party, which is great. I mean, I feel kind of weird about that because I'm like, why don't my kids want a party? Like, are they actually related to me? Are they actually my offspring? Because I want a party. <laughs> um, I went to Wazoo. That's what I do. Um, but they they don't want a party, which is actually great because then uh, it should be a little more low key. So Saturday, Sunday is going to be spent, you know, celebrating them and taking them various places that, that bring them joy. And um, so – if uh, if I make it till next week, then uh, we'll do another podcast next week. Well, the question has to be asked: uh, What what is is do, do you do you uh, when you celebrate Atticus's birthday? Do you celebrate his um, actual age? Or do you but do you also celebrate his leap year age? And then also on non leap years, uh, what day do you celebrate his birthday? Yeah, so we, we so we do the you know we do the the age age um, even though he's you know technically only one in leap years um, he'll have a real he'll have a real birthday again next year so that'll be exciting um, but yeah it's uh, it, it is definitely a little weird so we typically do so tomorrow um, so people who listen to this are listening on the twenty eighth today is the twenty seventh. Um, so the 28th is when we'll celebrate it. And that's mostly just because Joshua's birthday is on March 2nd. So um, celebrating it on March 1st, doing one on March 1st and then one on March 2nd seems, you know, like uh, that's a little too close for for two kids. And then um, and then also, you know, he was born in February. So it seems to make a little more sense to do it in February rather than uh, rather than March. So, uh, yeah, that's yeah. how we do it. it but it's definitely kind of weird. And I'm sure he'll I'm sure he'll either love it or or hate it when uh, when he gets a little older. I think it'll be a fun anecdote. You know, when you have to write like you're in some icebreaker situation and they want you to write down something interesting about yourself. He can just say right. he's a baby and like he doesn't have to think too hard about it. That, that is true. So we uh, will be able to tell him we did him that favor. Yeah, well done. Um, so you're going to be uh birthday parties this weekend uh i am excited so actually the reason i chose a barley wine um is because uh uh fremont is releasing their uh, third iteration of their their original was brew 1000 which is a bourbon barrel aged barley wine which is widely considered one of the greatest barley wines of all time um and then b2k which was considered to be um pretty much an equal of brew 1000 and so they've done the exact same batch for brew 3000 that tells you how many freaking batches that fremont brews uh because they would brew 3000 about uh two years ago or whatever when they put the the beer in but um they so uh uh so yeah i'm excited i'm gonna go wait in line for that i'm gonna take b with me but her uh her uncle lives pretty pretty close so i'll probably she'll probably hang out with him because it's pretty cold uh you don't want to hang out with a baby in 38 degrees for three hours no no Uh, that's that's not fun for anyone uh, yeah but yeah so you know if you're a beer nerd listening to this and you're going to fremont on saturday come uh, talk to me i'll bring a few beers we always have a few beers in line then we're gonna drink some big ass fucking barley wine when we get into fremont at 11 a.m and then buy buy our two bottles and then go hunt down the bottles at, at the grocery stores and, and other places later. So, um, but don't like, if you don't like barley wine, don't buy it, but do buy it and then just uh, give it to me. Uh, <laughs> as, as, many of that as I can possibly procure. Um, this uh, will be our, our version of Petram where it's like, um, you know, we're, you know, you're not going to actually pay us in cash. You're just going to find rare beers and, and gift them to us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Patreon, dude. Come on. That was close. Whatever. No, yeah, uh, yeah. Patreon is is interesting. Uh, uh, I, it's funny. Uh, we were talking about last week that there's people that just have there's podcasters that just make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year off Patreon donations, basically. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't consider it a donation. You're paying for it's it's kind of like the NPR donation but you're, right you're more like you're you're paying for the service just you're doing it after and you're doing it you know if you want to or not it's 
uh, it's like if you go to the Met in um, New York, uh, people will shy away because, you know, the advertised, uh, uh, you know, entry fee is like $25, $30, something like that. And so just an excellent museum, just like one of the coolest museums you'll ever go to, um, one of the greatest museums in the world. But honestly, if you're broke, just straight up go in and be like, I can only pay a dollar and they, they'll give you a pass and, and, and it's fine. You know, so that's basically how Patreon works. You know, um, you can donate whatever you want. And, uh, you know, I, because I uh, donate to or because I give money to um, this uh, Mall Couture podcast, I was able to buy the glass I was talking about earlier. And, um, you know, um, maybe uh, Jeff, maybe someday we'll use Patreon to become independently wealthy. Maybe someday. I'm down with that. Yeah. If Hey, if you all listening want to make Jeff and I independently wealthy based on this podcast. Yeah. Um, one, I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, but uh, <laughs> two, uh, thank you. Um, so yeah. on that note, um, if you like this podcast, we don't have a Patreon where you're not asking for money, but we are asking for five star ratings on whatever you are listening on. And we are asking you to subscribe to on um, whatever you're listening on because then it just gets automatically downloaded and when we look at the stats it just makes us happy um, yeah Lisa. so um yeah subscribe five star ratings as jeff said all the cool kids are doing it on itunes but you can do it on whatever service uh stitcher wherever you listen to obviously if you listen to it on like the link on coog center uh there's no way to give it a five star rating on there um because i don't think you can even uh you can't like recommend posts anymore like you could on Sesame Nation. But but you know what? You probably if you have an iPhone, just go find it and in, in, in on the podcast app and rate it five stars, even if you don't listen to it there. There we go. That would be great. Or Stitcher or whatever, you know, whatever the hell else, uh, overcast, whatever whatever else you're listening to it on. Um, yeah. yeah that. Um I am a little disappointed in myself. I am done with this beer. I'm a little drunk, but uh I don't yeah, know. I was going to say, you're not, th- that definitely did not pay off at the end the way I expected. Yeah, dude, you know, I drink a lot of beers this heavy, and I, I, I think even even when I'm not eating that much, I still have a, a little bit, and, and as we discussed, I'm a huge human. Um, yes, you are. That so, is true. So this is basically like drinking two beers, so it really wasn't that big of a deal. Two beers of yeah, an hour true. and a half is not that big of a deal. It just, like, if I would have downed it, I, I did halfway consider going and get another beer, uh, but uh, but you know I got that calorie count going on. I'm trying to lose some weight here. Um, catch Good up. for you. Well, I got to catch up. Good for you. Hey man, I'm. How's that keto working out for you? you this is going up. okay. I'm running again. That's kind of nice. There you go. There I'm you enjoying go. that. I've been trying to work out. Yeah. yeah. Give us five stars and and you know that that'll encourage us to work out. You know we'll get we'll get That's through. Right. This of the of, of this like, absurdly cold western washington winter like what the hell yeah screw that we don't live over here for that we I'm live done with it rain and warmer That's uh, right. I, yeah i had to get a new raincoat because i lost my other one and i, I haven't even had to use it because it's not raining it's just cold yeah screw that all right five stars subscribe thank you everyone we'll be back next week Thanks.